Hello and welcome everyone to the television studio here at Glendale University for our final talk of Creative Futures 2018. Uh, and without further, uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Corcoran. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike. And what I'd like to talk to you about for the next hour is something which is simple in theory and hopefully by the end of today, also simple in practice. I want to talk about how when faced with the small problems which might stand in front of us, the solutions actually lie in taking a step back and looking at the big questions. So. Let's start off by thinking about a few situations and see if any of these sound familiar to you. So, perhaps sometimes you feel like you've got a job, but no purpose. Yeah, sure, I get up and I go to the shoe shop every day, but I don't really care about shoes. Why do I keep doing it? Maybe you've got a purpose, but no job. I know exactly what I want to do. I've got the skills. Why is nobody paying me to do this? Maybe you've got no job and no purpose. I really don't know where to start. Or perhaps you've got several jobs and it feels like they're all conflicting with one another. On Monday, I'm sticking it to the man and on Tuesday, I'm working for him and it's pulling me to pieces. I think at different points in all of our lives, we've probably fallen into one or some of those categories. I know I have. And it can lead to problems. It can lead to being faced with a choice and thinking something along these lines. Well, I could do this, but if I do this, then oh, what's the point? But I suppose on the other hand, I could do that, but if I do that, then oh, what's the point? None of it really matters anyway. And reflect on what the last time you were faced with a decision which really should have been trivial, really should have been simple, and you've been sat there considering the options and not able to choose. I think everyone has felt that way probably thousands of times in their lives. And it can happen a lot when you're a student and when you're developing and when you're starting to move from having gone through life, going through the motions to all of a sudden trying to take back some control. So all is not lost. What we need to do is take that step back take that step back, lift ourselves away from the problem in front of us, away from the life situation we're in now, look down on ourselves and start to piece it all back together in a brand new way. It was John Donne who said that no man is an island. Everyone is connected with everyone else. Our world has never been more interconnected. Our world has never been more globalized. And when we act, our actions are both influenced by others and influence others. We are so interconnected. And so everything you do will have an impact on other people. Countless other people, your friends, your family, your work colleagues, and millions of people you've never met. They will all be affected by you, whether you like it or not. And it gets worse. Because it was John Paul Sartre who first said that man is condemned to be free. If you make a choice, that choice will have an effect on you and on countless other people. And if you don't make a choice, then that lack of a choice will have an effect on you and on countless other people. There is no escape. You are responsible for those choices. And so if you act, you have responsibility for what happens. And if you don't act, you have responsibility for what happens. We are not allowed to opt out. We are condemned to be free. We have a burden of responsibility and we are going to change the world, whether we like it or not. You will all change the world, every one of you. The only question is how you will change the world. And as soon as we realise that we will change the world, we will change the course of its direction forever, for ourselves, for our friends, for our families, and for everyone else who inhabits it now, and for everyone else who will inhabit it afterwards, then we can start to be more assertive and start to make sure that we use every ounce of our energy to make that difference count. 
So it has to start off by developing a worldview. And this is something which it's healthy to reflect on. It's not something which you should tear your hair out, keeping yourselves awake at night about every night. But every now and again, indulge yourself by thinking about the big questions, questions like these. What is progress? What does progress mean? What does it look like? How do we measure it? How do we know if we've made it? Are we generally making progress? Or are we generally going backwards? What are your thoughts on that? What is a good life? What does good mean? What does it mean to live a good life? Has anyone ever lived a good life who you know of, personally or historically? Do you think you're living a good life? If so, why? If not, why not? Why do we exist? What's the purpose of us all being here? Is it from within? Does it come from somewhere else? Do we have duties and responsibilities as a race imposed upon us? Or can we make those rules for ourselves? Answering questions like those will help you to start to paint a picture of the sort of world you want to see. Those opinions may be formed over the course of a whole lifetime. They'll very likely change from day to day, from week to week, to month to month, to year to year. But by ruminating on them, by reflecting on them, and by allowing you the time to really delve down into those issues, you can both be exhilarated by them, reveal things about yourselves that you didn't know before, and equally start to paint a picture of this world. And once you have a worldview, once you have some idea of that world that you want to see, you can start to think about what your role should be in creating that world. And that's where your field of expertise comes in. You're all students, you're all working towards degrees, you're all developing highly specialised expertise in different fields, all in the creative arts. So one could assume that the world all of you want to see understands the importance of the arts. For all of you, I'd hope the arts have a crucial part to play in developing a better world, whatever better means for each of you. And your field of expertise will allow you to develop the skills and the knowledge and the understanding to fulfill your role to bring about that vision. So by defining your field, you do a few things. You define a place where you'll put all of your energy. Because we only have so much energy, we have only have so many hours in a day, we only have so many years on the planet. And it goes quickly, so we have to use it wisely. Your field is the place where your energy should be focused. It defines the place where you should develop your skills. There's an infinite amount of things to know, and we have limited capacities. So we have to know which things we're going to become experts in. Where are we going to develop our expertise? What things are we going to be able to do? What are we going to be the best at? And we have to know how these things allow us to provide solutions. Because every business, every charity, every university, every organisation you can think of provides solutions. We're providing products and services and knowledge that help to make the world better, however we define that, to help bring about progress, to give people things that they need. We're always interacting by having needs and looking for solutions to them, by identifying problems and trying to solve them. So your field is the place where you will be developing the new knowledge, the new products, the new services, the solutions that will move the world forwards. And then when facing a choice, we start to develop a metric that can help us to make some interesting solutions. So, when you sit down and think, what's the point of doing that? Or what's the point of doing this? We can now look at things in a different way. If I do this, will it conform to my field, my role, and my worldview? If yes, it's probably something worth considering. If no, probably isn't. We've got a test 
a starting point to move forwards from. And how does this work in practice? Well, let me use the example of myself, my own business, and how I try my best to use these sort of considerations to help me make sensible and positive decisions as I go about my day-to-day -day life. My worldview is something like that. Bob Dylan usually puts things better than you can put them yourself. I'll let you be in my dreams if I can be in yours. So what are my answers to those big questions? What are the things that I think about when I try and develop my worldview? Well, I think that meaning ultimately has to come from inside here. I'm not looking up to the heavens. I don't feel that I've got any external duty that I have to fulfill as a human. I think that any meaning in life has to start in here. It has to be defined by me. I think that happiness is the thing we should be pursuing for everyone in life. Of course, you could talk for a year about what that means in itself. But broadly speaking, I think that happiness is the end in itself that we should want. It was Aristotle who said for something to be an end, you know, the things we should pursue should be ends in themselves. Do we work to get money? Well, maybe, but do we need that money for something else? If so, money isn't an end in itself. Is food an end in itself or does it stop us being hungry? Is a coat an end in itself or does it stop us being cold? We have to think about what are the things which we're not aspiring to have for some other purpose. And for me, happiness is probably the most important of them all. A world where I can be happy and everyone else can be happy surely is a good world to aspire to achieve. And I feel that ignorance is a threat to happiness. A lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding lies at the root of many of the problems our world faces today because ignorance can breed fear and fear can breed hate and hate can breed violence and prejudice and all sorts of other problems that we see in the world. And whether it's racism or sexism through to wars between countries that have raged on for centuries, often deep down the underlying problem is a, a one of ignorance. And so I've always passionately felt that ignorance is a great existential threat to happiness. And happiness is one of the things we should all be pursuing in a world which is worth living in for everyone. So that just begins to paint a picture of the world I hope to see. A view which is changing and evolving in my mind all the time, but these broad sentiments never go away. <laughs> and what do I believe my role, my small but not insignificant role could be in bringing about that world? Well, to in creatively engage audiences with difficult stuff. That's what I do for a living. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. But there's only one weapon we can use against ignorance. You can't drop a predator drone strike on it and wipe it out in one. Education is our only weapon. If you want to combat ignorance, the only thing you can fight it with is education. Education will be a lasting solution to a great problem. And education is difficult. And often the stuff which is hardest to engage people with, for the audiences it's hardest to engage with, is left alone or ignored, too difficult to touch. And often it's the people who've been ignored with the stuff that's been ignored, which becomes the root of the serious problems. And so I see my role in helping to reach the hardest to reach audiences with the most difficult things and to use all the creative tools at my disposal, at my disposal to help that to work. So what does that mean in practice? In practice, I've moved from an understanding of broadly what I think my role should be to a field of expertise, which I'm still working on, but a field of expertise that allows me to do certain things in that space which help to contribute to a solution to the problem. So one of those is identifying barriers to engagement, working with individuals, with organisations, whether that's big private companies, small charities or universities, 
to work out which audiences they're not connecting with, which things they're trying to communicate and what might be going wrong. Often I'll, I'd be described as a consultant with my professional work. I'm a freelancer, I work independently, I work with lots of different businesses. Consultant can almost sound like a dirty word to many people. It, it evokes images of pinstripe suits and really shiny brown shoes and big fat ties. And people go in for business breakfasts on their way to work. But for me, the analogy should really be with, with a medical consultant. If you have an injury and you see a consultant at a hospital, they look at the evidence in front of them, they assess the injury, they speak to you, they look at what they can take from that situation, they reflect back on the technical skills they've got from their professional training, they reflect on the wide ranging experience they've got from treating hundreds if not thousands of similar injuries in the past, and they bring all of that evidence together to propose a bespoke solution to your specific problem. And that's very much what I do when I work with organisations. I assess all the available evidence, the things they can give me, the things they can tell me. I reflect back on the things I've learned through my technical training. And I reflect on all the things I've learned through working with thousands of people in Wales, in the UK, and sometimes internationally too. And usually that allows me to come up with a helpful, beneficial, practical solution to their engagement problem, especially when identifying those barriers. Because the chances are, if they're struggling, then someone else in the world at some point will have struggled too. It allows me to design tools to facilitate engagement. Once I know what the barriers are, once I know what the sticking points are, we can work out how to address them. Is it that we're saying the right things but in the wrong way? Is it that we should be doing something instead of saying something? Should we be showing people things? Are we showing people the right things, but the presentation is wrong? Do we need new tools for different audiences? Did we actually have our audience defined slightly incorrectly? And so we can start to look at the creative tools that can address these barriers. And of course, I can also then use those tools to deliver Exhibit A, as we're doing now, and hopefully deliver in a way which is engaging and meaningful and helps people to understand. I would argue that an audience of aspirational, confident, talented young people completing studies in a university are an important audience. People who are going to make a big, meaningful impact to the world. I know that understanding where your role in the world fits into your wider philosophical worldview is really difficult stuff, and stuff the majority of the population shy away from ever thinking about, because it's scary. And so I hope that by being invited to take part in a conference like this one, in a room like this one, saying things like these, using images like these to help you along, we can guide our way through and hopefully make these things just a little clearer to understand and make all of your businesses and future endeavours a little bit more resilient and a little bit more successful. So it helps me to go from the vision, to the role, to the field, to those products and services, consultation, identifying the problem, suggesting the bespoke solution, production, taking that solution and managing the, deliver and managing the production of it, all the tools, all the resources, all the staff and all the finances that need to be brought together to achieve that solution, and presenting and delivery, standing in front of people and doing that work myself directly, person to person, whether that's face to face, whether that's on camera, or whether that's in some other way too. And then how does that lead me to actually answer some of those day-to-day -day decisions that I encounter constantly, as we all do? Well, let's go through them one at a time. Maybe the choice is, should I take the job? How do I start to approach an answer to that? Well, will that job fit within my field of expertise? If so, it's definitely worth considering. If not, I probably won't get it. And if I did get it, I probably wouldn't enjoy it because I wouldn't have a clue what I was doing. Is that job broadly in line with my role? If it's in line with the role that I want to play in the world, 
then I'll probably enjoy it, so long as I have those skills and it's in my field of expertise. Will it help me bring about the change I want to see in the world? If so, it's going to excite me. If not, perhaps it won't. And if I'm torn between two jobs and all things are equal, the same location, the same pay, the same conditions, the same convenience, and the difference is that one of them directly aligns with my worldview and one is going to pull me on a tangent, then I should pick the one which aligns with my worldview. I've got a system that can allow me to make that decision. Should I buy this book? Simpler decision, less important, less crucial, less to lose. But if I'm torn, if I'm sitting there feeling blank, now when I'm in Waterstones, I don't think, well, will buying this book make the world a happier place? But I've got a framework. I've got a framework which can link that all the way back through to the things I do day to day. So I don't sit in Waterstones thinking, will this book make the world a happier place? But I do think, will buying this book make me a better presenter? Will this book help me to design learning resources in a more powerful way? Will this book make me a better consultant? If so, then maybe that's a good investment because I can better fulfill my work, fulfill my role, achieve my vision. And if buying a book will make me happy, even though it has nothing to do with my work, well, that still achieves the world I want to see too. The person who wrote the book will be happy, the people in the shop will be happy, and I'll be happy. Well, I've done my bit. Should I have chips or mash tonight? Where does that fit into our framework? Well, I put this one in, not to be flippant, but to show that we have a framework which not only helps us decide between two equal and important decisions, but allows us to define which decisions are important and which aren't. Will it make any difference to the overall happiness of the world if I have chips or if I have mash? Probably not. Does it have anything to do with my role in making the world a less ignorant place by creatively in engaging audiences with difficult stuff? Probably not. Does it really relate to my field of consultation and production and presentation? Not really. Does it matter if I have pie or mash? No, flip a coin if you're not sure. If you're stuck with something really simple and you don't know why you're getting this cognitive roadblock and you can't make a decision, You've got a framework which tells you, this one's important. No, actually, it really doesn't matter. Just pick one and move on to something else. How should I use social media? Something you all encounter. You're all on there. You all use it in different ways. Sometimes personally, sometimes professionally. How you should use social media professionally? Well, it should be to promote your skills in your field. It should be to help you to further achieve your role. It should be to exude the values that are commensurate with your worldview. If I think it's important that we live in a world where people are happier, then I shouldn't be on social media trying to drag everyone down and being negative. And those of you who follow me on social media, which is some of you, will know that I hope, broadly speaking, I'm quite chirpy on there. I'm having a bad day. Maybe I just won't log in that day. In terms of the things I talk about professionally, I promote the presentations that I give. I promote the events that I work with. I promote the clients that I support to encourage others to work with me, to encourage others to learn from the best practice we're developing so that we can collectively help to achieve the vision for the world I want to see. And when I use social media privately with my friends and with my family to make sure I keep those positive relationships with the people I care about, does that relate to my role? Not really. Does it relate to my worldview? We're making each other happier. And so not everything is geared towards my job, but everything should be aligned towards my worldview. What about what clothes should I put on today? Maybe superficially seems as trivial as the chips and mash question, but I would argue that this one does matter. And I did think about this today. I didn't think, no, will, will the grey shirt make the world happier or should I go for a blue shirt or maybe a white shirt? But again, I had a framework which helps me to choose. A happier world is one where people are less ignorant. A less ignorant world is one where I can work to creatively engage audiences with difficult stuff. I'm going to do that through consultation and design and today through presentation. 
So my framework quickly leads me to framing my question in a better way. The question today was which clothes will help me to present as well as I possibly can. I don't want to be too cold. I don't want to be too warm. I want to be comfortable because I want to be thinking about all the things I want to say to you and not thinking about the fact that my feet are itching, that my shoes are rubbing, that I'm shivering, that I'm boiling. So I have to be comfortable. Equally, I want to make sure that you can concentrate as well as possible on the words that I'm saying and on the things that I'm showing to you and not getting distracted by, why is he wearing that ridiculous pair of trousers? And so I'm just quite plainly so that hopefully you've hardly even clocked what I'm wearing and instead you've focused on what I'm saying. And I've worn things which I'm comfortable with, make me feel comfortable in my own skin and so hopefully help to build up a rapport because I'm not a good actor and if I was trying to be someone I'm not, I could lose my integrity, we could lose our trust and this presentation would lose its impact. So to go what, to back to what I said before, if I felt, well, I'm a consultant now, so I suppose I, I better get my winkle pickers on and get my blue suit out of the cupboard and grease my hair back, I'd have walked in and you'd have thought, what an idiot. And you'd have probably made that judgment of me before I opened my mouth, thought, I'm not going to listen to what he's going to say. He clearly looks like a moron. And this would be a wasted exercise. I've worn things I'm comfortable with, which hopefully means that if you can relate to me, that this might work a little better. So a trivial question, but a framework that allows me to know that these sorts of decisions are not wasted energy. It still helps me in a very small but not insignificant way make the world a better place by wearing the gray shirt. And I'm gonna stop for a reality check because I know what I would be thinking if I was sitting where you are. And just to tell you a little story first, Bishop Barclay was a philosopher born in the late 1600s, living through the 1700s, who famously put forward an idea called idealism. Idealism said, essay est percipi, or to see is to be perceived. For Berkeley, the only things which have existed were the things in our mind's eye. The physical world was an illusion. And for Berkeley, God held together this illusion to make sure that when I can see the green water bottle on the table, you can see the green water bottle on the table. But the green water bottle doesn't exist, just my idea of it and just your idea of it. And this was a big political hot potato of the time. And one day, Samuel Johnson of dictionary fame was discussing this idea and someone asked what he thought of it and he said, I refute it thus, and he kicked the rock as hard as he could. And his point was, don't you tell me that that rock exists in my mind, because when I kick it, I feel it. And you might be thinking, well, it's all well and good to say every time you need to make a decision, reflect on your philosophical worldview, but I've got rent to pay and I need to eat. And the UN haven't rung me up much lately, whereas Dykeman Shoes want me to start work tomorrow. And so there's no point saying, just fulfill your field and fulfill your worldview because that's not the world I exist in. And I completely understand and I completely agree. We always have to make compromises. We have to understand how we can fit in the realities of life with the, eight, with the broad aspirations we're trying to achieve. And I, like everyone else, have had my fair share of jobs which haven't 100% driven me towards my worldview. Furthermore, there are many things I do now which contribute far less to making the world a less ignorant place than other parts of my work. However, I would say nothing I do conflicts with that. Sometimes I'm, I mean, life looks a little bit like this. You'll take some steps forwards, you'll take a few small steps back, you'll take lots of steps right and you'll take lots of steps left. And there'll be many occasions where you need to take a side step which is necessary to keep the roof over your head, the food on the table and your mind sane before you can get back onto focusing all your energy on the things you care about most. We all encounter that. The critical point is, if you don't know where you're going, then you can't know if you've stepped right, stepped left, stepped forward or stepped backwards. 
By having a worldview, knowing your role, knowing where your field of expertise is, and knowing the sorts of solutions you want to offer, you can know the direction you're trying to aim in and use that as a way to know if you're making a step forwards, left, right, or back. And you can usually avoid doing anything that directly conflicts with the world you want to see. And if you are doing things which directly conflict with the world you want to see, perhaps without even realizing it, that's the reason why you feel unfulfilled or unhappy. So once we have that line of sight in place, every tangent can always be traced back to the stream down off the mountain. Or to quote the great Yogi Berra, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. So knowing where you're going plays such a critical part. And I know that all of you training to be creative industries professionals are very likely, either for the rest of your careers or certainly at key points in your careers, going to work as independent businesses, as sole traders, as freelancers, or setting up a whole range of organizations with you guys at the front of them. And I want every single one of those to be successful. Successful on the terms you define, and I want you to be happy doing it. And so, as I was reflecting on the things I wanted to share with you today, I was thinking of what the questions should be in your mind when you leave this conference, when you leave this university, and when you get on with changing the world. The first question should be this. Is the product or service needed? These are the solutions you're going to offer. You should really start with making sure you have a solution that people actually want and need and will be beneficial. So before you remortgage your house to set up the chocolate teapot factory, just stop for a minute and think, I wonder how this is going to pan out. The second question, does this solution fit in with my field of experience and expertise? So we may decide, yes, we're 100% sure chocolate teapots are the way to go. They're the future. But hang on, do I actually know anything about chocolate or teapots? Because if not, then I'm probably not going to be able to make very good ones. So I either need to go and learn or reflect on some of the other solutions that I can bring about and offer. And the third question should be, will this contribute to the world I want to see? Sure, people want chocolate teapots. Sure, I know how to make them. But if, I, if my vision is for a chocolate teapot free world, then maybe this isn't the factory I should be opening right now. Those three questions will stand you in good stead, both to limit your risks of failure and to increase your chances of success. And let me show you why. Level one, question one, that's business for dummies. Everyone's business to have any chance of success should be offering products or services that people want or need. However, that alone is not enough. Your chances of failure are still reasonably high because you've got things which people want or need, but without the expertise to back that up, then there's no guarantee. Without the expertise to back that up, there is no guarantee that you'll be able to deliver a quality product which is good enough and better than your competitors. And if you're doing something you're not good at and delivering to a poor standard, that's probably going to make you unhappy and unfulfilled. So as the risk increases, the satisfaction drops. So what about question two? If you're operating on that level, they are far firmer foundations. You're delivering services, people want and need with expertise that you have. So your product and service is going to be good quality. You know you can do this well. Maybe you can do it better than anyone. That means you've got more chance of success. And in terms of your satisfaction, well, generally, we all feel happier when we're doing things well. If you know you're delivering a good product, if you know you're racing it, if you know you're better than everyone else, it's going to make you happier. But it's not the end of the story. Because level three is ninja level. This is the, a level that few businesses perhaps ever really reach, although some certainly do. And you'll all be able to think of examples of business leaders 
or people you know or people you've read about from history, you've certainly operated at this level. This is the level where not only do you have a product or service that people want and need, not only are you the expert who can deliver that product or service better than anyone else, but you are committed to a world where this really happens. This isn't just about business, this is about your dream. This is your vocation in life. You're getting out of bed every morning, not to make money, not, to just, not just to deliver a good service, but to change the world for the better and to be responsible for that change. Your risk of failure drops even more because you're gonna get out of bed with that much more energy, that much more commitment, and that much more rigor behind every decision you make. And your chance of satisfaction becomes far higher because the money wasn't the end in itself. The product wasn't the end in itself. Bringing about the change in the world to make you happy was the end in itself. And once you're thinking on this level, you can really start to get there. <laughs>